everybody. Uh, good afternoon. I am so excited today to have my guest, president of ICI, Dr. Lauren Tessier. Um, how do you say your last name, Lauren? I'm sorry, I should have asked that before, but it's fine. I really don't care. By the way, I grew up in Massachusetts, so I'm used to hearing it with the A H or <laughs> the I E R. Now that I'm up in uh, okay, Vermont, so, <laughs> so you don't. Need I to answer to everything. Yeah, <laughs> thank no you. No preference. Oh, yeah. awesome. Well, um, of course, our colleagues know you again as a president of ICI, but you've been in this field for quite a while. Um, I will formally introduce you in just a minute. Uh, let's do the real quick housekeeping. You guys have heard the spiel, but if you want to find any information, blogs, um, other things, you can go to my website, jillcarnahan.com. All of the free content for the past 12 years is there uh, for your perusal. Um, and then, of course, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. It's been so fun to provide even more free content. I think we have like 65 hours of interviews there with experts like uh, Lauren here. And so you can go there and uh, look at past interviews and enjoy those. All that content is free. Um, and please subscribe so you get updates there. Um, if we mention products, um, which I do if it's appropriate, well, you can find those at drjillhealth.com. Um, today, my guest, Dr. Lauren Tessier, um, naturopathic doctor in um, Vermont. Her practice, Life After Mold, is in Waterbury, Vermont, um, at the East Coast only formally certified Sears literate naturopathic physician. She is an expert. I always, always enjoy talking to her and learning things. And you know, guys, there's a secret. Um, one of the best things about doing these interviews is that I'm always learning things as I'm interviewing my colleagues. So it's kind of fun because I know we always get little tips from each other and um, it'll be no different today, I'm sure. So you're in for a treat. Um, and I just tell, was telling her before we started, um, she's just got this wonderful demeanor and presence and um, as such a, she's a great leader now with ICI. And so I know you'll enjoy her, enjoy the content. And if you do like it, please share. Um, back to her intro, um, Life After Mold Services, patients suffering from multi-symptom multi-system illness complicated by comorbid conditions such as um, multiple chemical sensitivity, MCAS, which is many of you know, um, uh, mast cell activation syndrome, chronic infections, including Lyme and co-infections, Epstein-Barr, CMV, et cetera. Uh, Dr. Tessier also provides clinical and corporate consults to physicians and corporations looking to improve their respective clinical and productivity outcomes. She has served as ICI, it's International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness. We'll be talking a little bit about that today because um, she's the president, I'm on the board, and um, it's a nonprofit organization that gets great information out. Um, a lot of patients ask me, hey, Dr. Jill, how do I find a physician like you who knows how to treat mold? Um, that's a place to go. That's a resource. And it's ICI.org. That's I-S-E-A-I.org. You will find that wherever you're watching this video in the links. Um, and again, we'll be talking a little bit about the upcoming conference and other things that are happening. Um, she has served as the um, president or actually roles of secretary, vice president, and now president. And she also has a free ebook called Mold Prevention 101. And um, you can download that. We'll be sure and uh, give links to her website and um, all her social media platforms at the end of the show. So welcome. Um, it's so glad to have you here, Dr. Lauren. Um, it's such an honor. Thank you so much. You are welcome. I always love to start with stories. So tell us a little bit about how did you get into naturopathic medicine? And then also, how did you get into mold and chronic? Because often, I don't know about you, but these things don't necessarily choose us. We kind of get drawn into them. So tell us more about your story. Yeah. So the, <laughs> it can be very long or very short. Um, your time. I, yeah. So I, I was always driven to uh, the service field um, in my undergraduate. I actually got a uh, dual degree in health psychology and um, pre-med. And then the time came where I was applying for med schools and there was a little bit of an itch of, am I going to go do ND, MD, and actually I found out about ND and it was like, yes, it, it hit all the marks and especially where I was coming from a, a pharmacy school in um, Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and there was a time and place for everything, um, but there was definitely that resonant energy of, I think I had one uh, herbs and nutraceutics class with this amazing professor, Lana DeBorkin, I believe she's still out there somewhere. And um, that was one of the things that really flipped the switch for me. So I applied to naturopathic school and I decided on Bastyr University out in Seattle. I went through all the hoops there, graduated and returned back to uh, New England 
and hung my shingle in my own private independent practice. And originally I, you know, was set up as a primary care, accepting insurance. And uh, what really moved me towards that mold space was uh, my town, also known as Waterbury, right? Mm-hmm. Buried by water, quite wow. literally. Yeah. <laughs> Um, they had a flood in 2011 with Hurricane Irene and I was you know showing up a year and a half or so later and still seeing clients that were having really bad brain fog and fatigue and then we'd come to find out that none of the naturopathic stuff was working right Um, and found out that they had their offices and their basements and then one thing led to another and kind of just mold opened up in front of me Um, at the time you know I uh, come to find out was also living in a space that had mold issues. And so the brain fog, fatigue, hormonal disruption, um, autoimmunity, all those things, you name it, I've been through it firsthand. Um, And so that was really, I think what solidified it for me and is really able to um, keep me in check when I'm interacting with clients. Cause you know, like having that firsthand experience is like, it's amazing what it does to being able to connect with people and also being able to stand by people and hold their hand through the process and be there for them. So, you know, I, it's like trial by fire. Um, and then one of the other reasons why I think, A, I fell in love with mold, but then B, I had a family member that when I was much younger, uh, I lost them to a very rare autoimmune disease called Wegner's granulomatosis. Oh, yes. And at the time, it took them about 16 weeks in a Boston regional hospital to diagnose them correctly. And uh, I remember going into their home with my mom and helping them clean up their space and getting them set to receive them back in the hospital. And um, it just always stuck in the back of my mind that there was gold in the apartment. And it always a dialogue with, you know, my family and I about it. So I, I think that there's a little bit of a um, emotional component too, of having suffered a loss and who knows if the autoimmune condition was in fact yeah. due to mold or worsened by, but for me, there was always been that thing. And if I can help people get better and get beyond their living situation um, into a better, you know, um, health situation, then that's, that's really what I'm here for. So, you know, that's, that's kind of how I got here and why I keep doing what I do. Wow. So, so many interesting things I want to comment on. First of all, it's so funny because I always resonate so well with my naturopathic friends and I have such respect because I feel like I've learned so much from you all uh, that we didn't get trained in, you know, whether it's colonics or castor oil packs or herbals or like it just so much richness has come into my practice from what you have, you have learned and all my colleagues in naturopathic medicine have learned. So I really respect that so greatly. Um, and I always say I had the heart of a naturopath because I did the same. I like applied. You do. Yeah. <laughs> I had traditional Chinese medical school and then acupuncture and then uh, naturopathic. And I actually applied to all those. I could have easily gone and I, you know, but the, the little trick was I was like, I'm going to infiltrate the conventional system <laughs> when I got, I, I go. heard my story, but it was funny because I'm like, I'm the secret infiltrator because my heart is really um, not all that bought in with the whole paradigm. There's some good pieces, but so I always love okay. um, and resonate with that training that you had and have such great respect for it. Um, the other thing is the um, interesting, like when you had your experience and kind of, and of course the town, um, like you said, when we've lived it, it's like no textbook, no lecture, no class could really teach you on that level. And I'm sure you've noticed this, but when I hear the stories, I start to just pick up these little clues that are very subtle. And I'm like, oh yeah, are you there? Remember that? And I remember in the beginning, I would try to be really careful because I didn't want to take any of my experience and like, um, right filter my patient's experience or assume that there was anything like mine, but I'm sure you noticed too, like it was shocking whether it was autoimmunity, multiple sclerosis, um, gut disorders, like inflammatory bowel. And all of a sudden they present like a normal case that we'd see. And you'd be like, oh my gosh, mold is underlying this kind of like your family member who had Wagner's. And again, you don't know for sure, but there is a high likelihood it was related. And don't you even find like news stories or these incidents or like certain uh, government institutions or prisons or schools, you start to hear these stories about all of a sudden a lot of mood disorders or learning disorders or behavioral disorders. And I, now that we know what we know about mold, I wonder how much this is affecting so many areas. And when you have that filter, like you and I do, don't you just see things that you have this like thought in your mind or like, 
yep, mold is in, involved in that, right? Right. And it, you know, and it sounds like you, you know, watching the filter that you're looking for. I always tell people like, yeah, I have a hammer. I promise everything's not a nail. Exactly. However, exactly. you know, I'm going to try my best. And I always let people know if I don't think you're going to be a mold. I do more than mold, right? Yeah. I'm a traditional yeah. trained naturopath, but you know, if I don't feel like I am equipped or it's a problem outside of my scope, I always tell people, I'm going to get you to where you need to be. You know, like I'm okay with being a step absolutely on the, on the path, you know? So <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about autoimmunity. This is absolutely huge. It's the fourth leading cause of mortality. If we take, so right now it's very siloed. So we have rheumatology sees rheumatoid arthritis and we have neurology sees multiple sclerosis and we have gastroenterology see Crohn's and colitis. So we have yeah. these silos in this brokenness of autoimmunity into its silo, depending on organ system. However, the mechanisms are the same. And I would say mold may be the number one, if not one of the most um, common drivers Let's talk just a little bit about that. Like, um, how does this, mold, first of all, how does mold affect the immune system? And then how does that drive autoimmunity? And then what do we do about it? Let's have this discussion a little bit for those of you who are listening and have autoimmunity or know someone who does. Right. And so um, maybe forgive me if people already already know these things. So maybe like a 20,000 foot. Oh yeah, let's start there. Because that way right? anyone listening can relate. Yes. Yeah. So autoimmunity is when um, your body loses track of what is truly yourself and what is truly something that should exist on the outside of the body. And your body has a few checkpoints that it goes through to make sure that when you're training your immune system cells that they go, oh, no, that's my kidney. I'm going to leave that alone. X, Y, Z. So um, we have a few different points, checkpoints, we call them. And so what ends up happening with autoimmunity is some of these cells kind of slip through the cracks and they beat the checkpoints and then they get into the systemic periphery. And, and instead of knowing to leave these parts of our body alone, they actually will go and attack them. And some of the thoughts about autoimmunity is that it's partly genetic, partly environmental and partly um, infectious. And when you step back and you look at the fact that mold and fungi can be two out of those three, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it can be a environmental toxin that can also be an infective agent. You're kind of looking at like, well, you know, this, this is potentially bigger than just heavy metals alone, where it's just one yeah. factor. So you almost have this autoimmunity double whammy. So, um, you know, Mycotoxins, from my perspective, seem to be probably one of the bigger initiators of autoimmunity. I think of mold maybe a little bit differently than some of my other SIRS trained counterparts, mm -hmm. which I believe you were, you were also SIRS trained. Yeah. Um, so I, I actually think of them as two separate entities, but with some overlapping. And I think that there's some immune system confusion that can happen from kind of the SIRS global inflammation realm. And then we actually see some direct autoimmunity causing issues with mycotoxins themselves aside from SIRS. Like we see in the animal literature that certain mycotoxins can flip on the genes in the um, animals, in animal studies, uh, can flip on the genes that uh, correspond with uh, type one diabetes and also Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So if we're seeing that in the same animals that where we study and develop our drugs and all these things, it's, you know, we, we have to tread a little bit more cautiously before we throw the baby out with the bathwater uh, when it comes to mold and autoimmunity, but I know I'm preaching to the choir when, when I'm saying that. No, that's a great explanation and so good to kind of get the framework. And uh, this is something I don't, I talk a lot about my history and what I've been through, but that's something I have, I've mentioned, but not a lot is right after my mold exposure in 2015, I was diagnosed with type one diabetes. Um, and again, I don't know if you even knew that, but it's so interesting. You mentioned that literature because there is no doubt in my mind, first of all, I had a very strong family history of diabetes, but it was more type two and it was right. family history. And I had lived a really clean lifestyle as far as eating and low glycemic and exercise. So that way I should not have any risk. Um, but what happened is again, that I, there's no doubt in my mind that mold triggered that. Um, I had positive GAD autoantibodies. I went to an endocrinologist. He said, yeah, this is type one. My A1C was rising, but here's the thing, the really neat thing, because once again, just like my Crohn's disease, that's considered, you know, incurable. And I think it was just enough of the beginning. Um, now had my pancreas had that attack for years, it probably would have been permanent but I am no longer like technically diabetic. And that's like a, another miracle because what happened is that detox from mold and then really working for a while, I had to go completely 
low carb, low sugar. I never had to do insulin and I did a few peptides and things that, but I literally feel like I reversed the type one, but back to your original point, I wonder how many people who are genetically predisposed, um, whether they're children or for mine, mine was considered the adult onset, like latent onset type one, because it was an autoimmune in nature, but it wasn't until I was in my early forties where it manifested, but very relevant because number one, we consider that incurable. Number two, there's no doubt in my mind, mine was absolutely triggered by the mold exposure. Right. So um, yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I want to just give hope if you are a new onset late and adult type, you know, check for mold as a trigger because um, I'm a poster child for it being reversible. Right, right. So let's talk more about autoimmunity. So obviously these mechanisms, I love how you divide the mycotoxins from um, colonization uh, infections, like even fungal infections and then also mold itself. Because I, I think you gave a lecture that was um, talking about that as well. Cause we got the spores, we got the fragments, we got the, um, do you want to talk just a little bit about um, how the mycotoxins affect the immune system? And you mentioned that briefly, but where that lies in the autoimmune spectrum. Yeah. So that's, that's another thing. And again, I, I, really cross my T's and dot my I's when it comes to any claims that I make. And I like being very clear with people. A lot of the information that we have is coming from the animal literature mm -hmm. and both in the kind of biomedical field, but also in our agriculture and veterinary fields. But again, these are the animals that we're testing our drugs on going through these um, drug developments and things like that. So we really need to consider the animal literature rather than poo-pooing the animal literature. Mm -hmm. And so um, when you dive into the animal literature about the interactions with mold and, um, excuse me, with mycotoxins and autoimmunity, you start to see these patterns where mycotoxin exposure in animals are correlated with bumps, uh, increases in IL-6, mm -hmm. which can be a precursor for another cytokine called IL-17. Yeah. And these two cytokines are a core component of autoimmunity, more specifically kind of the IL-17 being the big picture one with the IL-6 kind of like moving and rolling the stone down the hill to get things going. And so not only do we see that um, IL-17 will go up with mycotoxin exposure, but we also see a drop in something called our Tren and our drop uh, and an in increase in something called TH17. So all of this alphabet soup, if you guys can kind of put it aside for a second in our immune system, we have different white cells that are responsible for different actions. And this is a very, very super distilled uh, description of what they are, but we have um, TH, when I say TH, they're T helper cells. So that's what it's used for, or there's TH1s, which kind of walk the line of autoimmunity. There's TH2, which are kind of the allergy picture. And then there's TH17s. Originally, we thought that if someone had more TH7, uh, TH1s, then they tend to lean a little bit more autoimmune. But as some of the research has developed, we've actually seen that a bigger predominance of TH17 cells seems to be much more correlated with autoimmunity. And our TH17 cells are not only involved in our infection defense process, but they're also involved in the development um, an exacerbation of autoimmunity and what do they produce, but that cytokine IL-17 that I mentioned before. So we have seen that mycotoxins will drive up that IL-17 leading to more autoimmune issues, uh, drive up TH-17, those T helper cells that make that stuff. And then what they do on the flip side is they will actually suppress your T regulatory cells. And your T regulatory cells are like the referee of the immune system. They will go in and kind of keep everything in balance, make sure all the T helper cells are behaving themselves. So we also see in conjunction with this TH17 and the IL-17, we see the T regs kind of drop off mm -hmm. or stop being as efficacious. And we also see some of that in both um, human cell studies and also the living animal studies too. So um, those findings definitely uh, have a hand in both worlds, which is interesting to see. 
Yeah, thank you for breaking that down. Because again, guys, this may sound like a really complex immune lecture, but there's some real simple ideas here that really are important. And if you understand, and of course, with COVID and the pandemic that we had last year, a lot of people have heard about cytokines and they understand some of this more than they ever used to. We can actually have a conversation that includes IL-6 and people are like, I've heard of that. <laughs> At least I've heard of it. Um, you mentioned this like control of T-reg cells. And I always like to talk about them like the bouncers at the bar. They're like, hey, right, guys, right, right. calm down. You know, so I love that. And so if you're thinking about this, you got kind of the police, you know, or the bouncers or the people that are keeping the order and those diminish in mold too. And, and the infection or inflammation drives that TH17 that Dr. Tessier talked about. And then it's kind of this out of control brawl at the bar. And again, it's good because it's like trying to fight infection, but it overdoes it and then accidentally attacks yourself. So right. um, I think that makes perfect sense. Even if you don't have an immunology degree, you probably understood what, what we've been saying. Really if, important though, because this is this is the driver of autoimmunity. And if you keep the, the bar metaphor going, <laughs> ultimately yeah. that fight is going to pull in innocent bystanders. Yes. You know, so those T-reg cells are really just there to make sure that the fight doesn't happen and everyone kind of stays out of yes. trouble. So say someone comes in, you and I both see this, they come in with MS or they come in with Crohn's or colitis, or you name any autoimmune disease, mm -hmm. um, Hashimoto's, type one diabetes. Um, how would you do a workup to check if mold would be involved? And then how would you, do you treat? Let's talk a little bit about someone who might have autoimmunity and what you would do for kind of a workup. Sure. Um, let me take a step back and collect my thoughts about that. So a lot of my clients end up coming to me, as, as I'm sure they have you, uh, Dr. Cunningham, where um, they've seen many, many doctors. They've been to the neurologist. They've gone through their PCP. I mean, heck, some of them have even had the psych workup for depression and all these things. Um, my practice is called Life After Mold, so it does very much self-select for mold issues. Mm -hmm. So I kind of have that set up, which is a, a saving grace a little bit in the dialogue with some of my clients. Um, so mold is really never too much of a question in our dialogue, but um, when people come in because of their extensive health back history, they've usually already seen a neurologist. They've gone to a pulmonologist, they have these things. So all the important rule outs are typically have been done or if they haven't yet, I will send someone to make sure they go back and dialogue with their PCP about getting appropriate referrals for where they need to go. So. With that being said, always for me, ruling out the worst case scenario as with any responsible physician like yourself. So um, after that, we then do a really thorough history about current and past mold exposure. And um, again, a lot of times it's people have had a historical issue and that's when we start to think of bioaccumulation in any of the fatty tissues in the body or they might have a current one that they know of that they're working on getting out of. So. Um, when I do my mold workups, a lot of it really starts with just doing a simple mycotoxin evaluation. And if any of you are familiar with mold on here, which I'm sure many of you are, um, I'm sure you've heard that mycotoxin testing isn't perfect yet. And it's true, it's not. But how I use it with people is also understanding that um, their environment is a core component already. So rather than using it from a diagnostic perspective, I'm using it from uh, more of a, a screening perspective and also for a tracking perspective. So I usually do a good amount of prep work before I even get people to take that urine mycotoxin test because that initial prep work is required for people who are really sensitive to glutathione, which we use, or at least I use uh, for provoking people for that first initial test. Yeah. So sometimes testing for me doesn't happen for you know maybe even one or two months out yeah. for a lot of folks. And if you're chemically sensitive, it might even be upwards of three months to be frank. Oh, couldn't agree more. So I love that. And this is a great time to talk briefly about the ICI. So as clinicians, there's three main labs out there that do urinary mycotoxin testing. I'm sure like you, you've used every one of them. Maybe you can talk about just briefly who they are. And then also what ICI is doing to help us just, you know, discern what might be our best method of testing. Cause we've all been like, well, which one's best. And mm -hmm. can you share just a little bit about the study that Sure. So there's there's three major urine mycotoxin tests. Each have their own separate methodology or how they run the test, which also means that they have a slightly different ability to define what is in the urine. Um, so there's one company, uh, Real Time Labs, that uses an ELISA methodology for all the science nerds out there. 
There's another one called Great Plains Laboratory that uses uh, liquid chromatography. And then uh, the third one is Vibrant, which uses the microchip assay. Um, because of my clinical setting and how I've seen it correlate with my clients and how I really know it as a tool for my practice, I tend to lean more towards the real-time labs, but they can all offer us something. Um, if you come up positive, then there's something to work on there. It's really helpful. So um, that tends to be the major urinary ones. There is, I believe, um, my micro lab, which does a um, IgG, IgM uh, serology. So looking at the antibodies to these uh, mycotoxins. And um, I've seen that come through the office a few times. I have not yet quite implemented it in my practice just because I really feel comfortable with the real-time labs and my clinical assessment. So um, the nice part about ICI, actually it's more than the nice part, a huge blessing that occurred for ICI back in November uh, during Giving Tuesday, right after Thanksgiving was, uh, we did a fundraiser to raise research money to check on the validity of these tests. So ICI will be doing one of the first split urine samples, uh, split urine sample testing research study with these different companies. So we will even get to see um, if, the results are reliable yeah. within one specific uh, specimen. So we're very excited about that. Um, and, you know, unfortunately testing like this and research like this takes time and it takes a lot more money than I think people yeah. realize. <laughs> so um, we're excited to at least start there. And we know that so many people have other bigger clinical questions with the result, uh, with regards to the application yeah. of these testing. Um, and we will get there. We will get there. So this is kind of the first step. So we can say, hey, look, we're on the path, guys. And this is what we found out. So it'll be an integral part, I think, for a lot of so people. excited. And again, you as president have been driving some of these um, these initiatives. And it's so exciting because we all have similar clinical questions. We're all in our little holes doing our thing, you know, our silos kind of. So it's so fun to collaborate because we can get across the country um, in different cases. And, and we all have slightly different opinions. And yet I'm always surprised mm -hmm. at how aligned we are. Right. You know, like often when we really go into that clinical experience, it's more similar than different between all of us who are using it. So that's great. So um, I will uh, make sure in the links uh, that you guys, I'll share the testing. This will be through your doctor. This is not something you can order on your own. So you'd have to work with your doctor. I'll be sure and link the ICI, um, it's ICI.org as well for if you want, need to find a physician, you can look there for certified docs as well. You know, briefly, just a little tangent. There's, um, I, we're in the midst of certification process, but is that um, the thing you'd recommend for patients like who are looking for mold docs? Tell a little bit about like where they'd go. Is there a, there's the find the practitioner on the website, correct? Sure. There's a, there's a get help page on the website that kind of auto populates a, a map there for folks mm -hmm. who um, have uh, worked in our field for a while who are mold literate or have gone through other extensive mold trainings elsewhere. So, um, and I've been really happy with everyone uh, listed on the website. It's a great community and they seem to me really too, well because of course you and I, I mean, at least for me, I, I can't help everybody. We get a lot of questions as you probably same thing are known for mold, same as me. And so there's a lot of you who can't see me and it's so nice to know that we have a group like this that can help and that we can trust that most of the people on there, all of them, you know, have, have training and, and all of that. So, right. Um, real quickly, again, another tangent, but let's talk about IEPs. What are IEPs and how can ICI help with IEPs as well? Because that's a critical component of getting well. Right, right. So IEPs are indoor environmental professionals. Uh, these are folks who have been um, in the field for quite some time, I believe. Uh, the, and forgive me because I'm not overseeing the ICI branch yeah. of I, you know, <laughs> of the IEP branch of ICI, but I believe they need... Um, 10 plus years of working in the field. Yeah. So any IEPs that are listed on your website are not, you know, Joe Schmo who's had a, a water remediation place for, you know, one year or something like that. And the other part of us checking them out is they really need to um, be endorsed by a mold or environmental illness literate physician. So it's someone who has worked with these doctors before and really knows the in and outs. And, each IEP is going to be different. Their background is going to be different. Some of them are gonna have very advanced degrees in building sciences. A lot of them will have um, 
lesser advanced, that they'll have the experience of the boots on the ground. And I think that that's really the important thing to drive home here. We are really working to protect the people who are coming to seek help through the ICI listings. Oh, so good. And really, as you well know, this is like the number one thing that I need help with. Same with you, probably, because we can know there's some mold in someone's environment, but I'm not the expert to tell them exactly where it is or how to fix it. We have to know a lot, right? Like I end up knowing a lot about environment, but it's not, I'm always like, you, we need to make sure. And what I've seen over and over, I'm sure you have too, is if you get the wrong inspector, the wrong mediator, it can make a bad situation much worse. Either someone's been told two or three times, there's no problem, you're fine. And yet they think they're going crazy because they know their environment is not okay, but they can't find the problem. And honestly, that is the critical component to get Getting someone well is that they have a, uh, a safe environment from exposure for the most part, at least um, in order to heal. Right. And I think the three things that I want to take home from just that one statement alone is, um, you know, look for an IEP who is willing to drill a hole in your wall mm -hmm. and take an in-wall sample. If they're not going to do it, they have a huge potential to miss something big. And this is coming from firsthand experience, not just from being a physician. This was an issue that I had in my home. Um, the other thing is, um, oh, it's gone. Just like that, it's gone. <laughs> um, it, it'll come back to me and we'll, we'll double back to it for sure. Um, but also making sure that your IEP is willing to answer your questions. Oh, and it's back. And, if you can work with a third independent party separate from your homeowner's insurance. Yes, yes. If I could say that a million times over, I would. Um, and I have had firsthand a mold inspector from a uh, insurance company versus um, the person that I rely on for my clients and the results were night and day. Yeah. So always be aware of the biases of the people who you're coming in to, to do your work for you. Yeah, I've had, I can't even tell you the number of patients who've had one, two, three, four, even up to five inspections that have come back negative. And I literally now, if someone comes in, we see the clinical picture, whatever that looks like, that I have a suspicion that mold might be involved and I'm doing the testing to prove. Mm -hmm. um, if they just say, I had an inspection, everything's fine. I never trust that until I know more details. And I will say, I am not the expert to comment on this, but I've seen enough that Air sampling alone may not be enough. Now that's one amazing tool in the toolbox, but I find often because what happens typically is a really nasty, sticky, wet molds like Stachybotrys ketomium need a water source. They tend to be hidden. They tend to have a water source and they tend to be stuck behind a wall under a floor somewhere. And they mm -hmm. typically, unless it's like past hurricane and it's massively covering all the walls, they actually typically don't get into the air. And if they are in the air, it's a very bad situation. Mm -hmm. So if you can have very significant, toxic, sticky, dark black molds in the house and the air sampling looks pretty good or even perfect. Right, right, absolutely. And kind of taking it a step further, there was a piece of research that showed that there is a significant amount of force that you need to like land on a wall in order to get the sticky, heavy spores of stacky to be airborne. So, you know, all the perturbing in the world isn't gonna do it unless it's in the right space or, you know, so I 100% agree with that. And um, from the other perspective too, I think a lot of people have put a lot of investment, especially from the service camp about your ERMI must be less than two. Yeah. And without, the discussion of this is something where you're taking one number minus a second number to get a result and if you play around with one number being bigger than the other and all this yeah. you can get what looks like a really safe army but it's dangerous as all get out you know i saw a army that had a, something like a 500,000 spore count in group one mm -hmm. and the army didn't look horrible the army was an eight you know like it, so you really need to make sure that you aren't just depending on numbers because there's so many people who are looking for safe homes yeah. and they pull this ERMI and they're like, I can't live here. And unless you sit down with someone who actually yeah. kind of vaguely gets it, um, you're going to miss many opportunities for potentially finding safer living. So I, yeah, mold testing both in the environmental yeah. realm and in the medical realm is it's difficult. It's very difficult, difficult isn't it? Why a lot of people don't do it. 
And we have to kind of like, again, uh, this is where the science and the intuition, the right and left brain come together because you and I, as we've had experience, like I love the science. I'm like you, I really base things on great science. And as we don't have answers, I continue to try to help to seek or add data to the pool or whatever. However, there's an intuition to this and intuition actually comes from great science. Some of the studies on gut instinct are like right on the money for accuracy, maybe more so than a scientific study on data points. The reason for that is, as you and I have these, you know, five, 10, 20 years of experience, we add this pattern recognition system in our brains and our subconscious can analyze in a split second, millions of pieces of data versus our conscious mind analyzing hundreds or thousands of pieces of data. So there's this really complex system that we all have that are in medicine that we've honed and that's actually very accurate. Now, what I always do is I have a hunch or an intuition. I, I prove it with the science, but there are times when I'm listening to the story and I'm like, I am pretty darn sure there's mold involved. My office um, staff jokes because I'm about hundred percent accurate with that. <laughs> like so far, I don't think I've had a case where I've had a suspicion that we haven't found later. Back to the ERMI. If you heard that word, you're like, what's an ERMI? I just want to pre briefly define. So there's two main companies. You might have another one, but the two that I use are, I think, Envirobiotics and then Mycometrics.com. Yep, Envirobiomics. Thank you. M I C S. Yep. Envirobiomics and Mycometrics.com. And you can order their dust samples. So they basically give you a dust cloth, you check the dust in your home, and they look for DNA in that dust of mold. So it's kind of a historical snapshot. Again, just like anything, it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. I do find it a useful tool, number one because patients have access to it without an inspector if they need a pre-screen or they're looking for rentals or it's something that patients can get easily. Um, it's the number two, like you said, I never even look at the ERMI score. It doesn't mean it doesn't have validity, but I feel like it has a lot less validity than looking at the numbers and understanding what we're looking at. And again, mm -hmm. I'm not the expert, but I, like you, I can see patterns. I always look for ketomium stacky, some of the really nasty yep. ones. And if they're even like five or 10, even though that number sounds really low, that could be very concerning because they're so nasty. They're so toxic. They're the most right. toxic to the kidneys and the lungs and the immune system. Um, so you can get that yourself. You can order yourself and then find a doc um, that can work with you or an inspector. Inspectors can look at those too. And then they can bring their own data, their infrared cameras, their drills in the wall, their moisture meters, all the things that they have. Right. Um, let's talk a little bit about pediatrics because yeah. you, you mentioned that you have a lot of experience there and kids are not little adults, but they do experience some of this toxicity. Um, what have you seen kids present with and how would you address a child who had a mold exposure? Sure. So pediatrics, um, it depends on the age bracket, right? And what the child is capable of conveying and sharing, you know, little nuggets, like really small little baby nuggets. We're probably dealing um, more so with um, uh, skin issues, colic, those kind of things that present obviously for the caretaker. Uh, as we get a little bit older into elementary school um, age, we're seeing vision changes. I see vision changes so often for kids where they'll almost get like a double vision, but their vision will be completely normal. Um, situational headaches where the kid goes to school, they have a headache, they come home. Um, behavioral differences, depending on location versus mom's house, dad's house, school. It's not always the social environment they're in. Um, and then GI stuff, uh, food intolerances. Um, and then we also see some of the breathing issues. We'll get the allergic shunners. We'll get the, the, the nose salute. Is it the allergy salute where they'll yeah. do the, you know, and you get the little crease there. So um, I think once kids get a little bit older and they get into their teens and they have a little bit more um, self-awareness, it's easier to get conveyance of time and curiosity and stuff. But um, those symptoms are typically what I see with the, the younger kiddos. And then with them, uh, what would be the difference? Say you have an eight-year-old, let's just take that for example. Um, how might you start with detox or treatment of an eight-year-old? Sure. Um, eight-year-old, again, I would probably go very gentle with on-ramping them. And I, I do provoke with my testing um, and usually to uh, start with provoking, I do some biotherapeutic drainage mm -hmm. or to prep for provoking, um, I'll work with uh, phospholipids, phospholicholine, phosphatidylserine, um, maybe a little bit of melatonin. And depending on if they tend to lean more GI or neurocognitive, there might actually be some like lymphatic network that I'm working on with them. Um, and then after I get a concept of what is happening for the test, that's when I bring on a binder. 
And usually with kiddos for binders, um, we're talking charcoal. You know, I think a lot of people get really excited about the sexy concepts of like, oh, clay for this and yeah. zeolite for this. And it's all based on animal literature. And if someone hasn't studied adding folic acid to a five to pound, five to pound mound of grain and seeing how the horse reacts, it's not going to be suggested. And I have seen charcoal drive down all the numbers across the board. Um, I, I love, love that you say that because what people don't know, you know, like colster, I mean, like you said, so sexy or whatever. I personally, in my journey, I used only charcoal period. And I, I'm, I'm completely healed from mold and I'd never used cholestyramine and even glutathione. I wasn't able to take it for two years. So the main part of my detox, I use precursors and people are surprised to hear that. Cause they all think, in fact, don't you hear a lot of people like, Oh, I can't take that. I'm not, I'm not going to get well. Right. They hear this, that you must take cholestyramine or glutathione or some sort of protocol. I love that you said that because again, in my own history, literally charcoal has been the it factor that's it even now <laughs> and there's, there's even studies out there about how um what is it okra yeah okra does like a one one sixteenth of the job of, of cholesterol you know so fiber is is not a horrible thing it's just making sure if there's one thing that i really push on for people is making sure that they have the right and correct phospholipids because you're not going to get the toxin onto the bile and then it backs up in the liver kicks into systemic, gets redeposited, hits the kidneys, causes all types of issues. So um, if there's one thing in addition to the whatever binder you want to use, is making sure that those fossil lipids are already Okay, let's there. talk a little about that because I totally agree. And people are already asking questions as of what does that mean for like therapy? And then also, so phospholipids first, and then let's talk about the enterohepatic recirculation bile. Mm -hmm. What can we do to stimulate? Because that's kind of an unsexy thing too. And right. you know, whether it's bitters or castor oil, I want to know from your perspective, what else would you do for that bile um, secretion? So first phospholipids and then bile. Yeah, so phospholipids absolutely have to be brought on before, in, in my opinion, before you even start pushing on or playing or modifying bile. Um, I, I think of it as a roller coaster metaphor. Like you, you're at a park and you have a roller coaster and you have the roller coaster going through the line and coming back around and going to pick people up. So the roller coaster is the bile yeah. and the cue of people are the toxins and it takes phospholipids, phosphatidylcholine to get the people out of the line and into the roller coaster part. And if you don't have that rate limiting step there, those people are going to back up that line and it's going to go all the way out the park to the parking lot, et cetera, et cetera. So the phosphatidylcholine I use for a couple of different reasons. Sure, it's, it's liver loving. It's actually super duper antioxidant for the bio caniculi, all the hollow parts of the liver and the gallbladder. Um, but it's also needed to get those toxins onto the bile. And then it's also protective to the nervous system too. So there's a few different reasons why I use it. I usually just hone in on the bile talk when I talk about it. So um, the phospholipids would be a core component. And with the choline, I usually use two forms. I use a CBP precursor for people, yeah. which tends to cross the blood brain barrier. And then I use that kind of like final form heavy, just full out phosphatidylcholine, which um, from what I understand tends to not cross the blood brain barrier as well. And so I think of it as more of a, a liver heavy phosphatidylcholine. Yeah. Um, when it comes to bile and bile production, I'm sure every naturopath who might be listening to this is going to be like, oh, oh. but I, I don't use, I don't use bitters that often. Um, mostly because it's what does the bandwidth of my client yeah is my client going to remember to sit down and take the bitters and then we're timing the binder with the yep. bitters and all yep. these things and so i usually just trust in um cholecystokinin to like do its job so i just ask people make sure that you're having a fat containing meal and make sure um, that's a good fat you know and because of you i know to not push hard on uh, coconut oil because of endotoxemia. So I've yes. always carried that with me <laughs> since I heard you speak about it. Um, and so I tend to go more um, grass fed um, butters and ghees and meats, anything that is high fat for when we're timing those binders. So 
no herbs. But if someone's like, I really want to use herbs and I want to make it, I'm like, okay, like, sure, let's do it. Let's try it. Yeah. Um, but it's, it tends to not be a core part of what I do with people. No, I, I agree because it, it really is like the perfect is the enemy of the good. And that's how with these supplement regimens, we could go crazy and have hundreds of things in every hour of the day. And I always same thing. I'm like, okay, what's going to get, you know, yeah, you could take that, but what's going to be doable. Um, how do we make this like a doable protocol? So that's great. Do you recommend castor oil or coffee enemas, either one of those things or just uh, rarely or how often are you using those things? Depending on the person and depending on the case. I, I, like castor oil, I appreciate it topically for some folks. Um, I wish it did a little bit more um, than I would expect or want it to do, but coffee enemas, uh, and specifically for folks, when you start doing the digging, it's green coffee or lightly roasted. There are specific coffees that correlate with these yeah. enema kits. Um, but those can be amazing for people because the caffeic acids in those, they don't stimulate people. They don't make people right. feel jittery, which is really cool to see. And then they help boost the glutathione production in the liver through, um, there's no pun intended, but I don't need to put this any other way through like the back door, because you're actually accessing the back door of the liver through a separate circulation. So sorry for the back door. No, honestly, I was, it's so funny. Cause again, I always joke cause I'm an MD and MDs don't talk about coffee and this, but it's so powerful. What I saw, you've probably heard me talk before Switzerland was there two different years and a uh, total detox. And I saw these people that were kind of, I mean, really they were in their eighties. They were not super healthy overall. And they were just flying through these detox protocols. And my question clinically was like, what is so different? I mean, first of all, no EMF clean food. There's all kinds of things that were different. Right. But what happened was everybody in the program was able to do coffee enemas nightly in their rooms. And I was like, wow, this is, um, and they use, we actually import coffee enema kits from Switzerland because they're so easy to use. And it's German coffee, green coffee that has charcoal in it. So it's kind of a unique product you just mix it you know um in the the bottle and it's so simple so i'm a huge fan of that as well um this is so much fun we have to do this again but we're just about out of time so i want to um oh my gosh i know right <laughs> <laughs> like we have got so but let's talk just briefly about like any final words of if, if people I know a lot of people who are um, in the chat today um, have had questions experiences in that any words like someone who's maybe feeling overwhelmed or hopeless that you would want to leave with people and then we'll ask about where to find you yeah yeah I you know stop breathe and find your support one of the hardest things is approaching mold without the social support. And I know how mold can really um, shift your social relations with the people in your life and it causes a lot of undue stress. So if you have someone in your life that is there and supporting you, move towards that. If you have people who are unsupported and doubting, really reconsider your relationship with that as you move forward. If you know what's right for you in your health, you really need to trust yourself and um, move in the direction that's right for you. Um, there are plenty of mobile literate physicians out there. I'm not gonna be everyone's cup of tea. Jill, you might not be everyone's cup of exactly. tea, XYZ <laughs> person, you know? So um, always find a physician that you resonate with. If you go in and you meet for the first time, you're like, oh, this isn't it, that's okay. Um, and so it's okay to shop around and find something that's a match. The other thing that I implore people to do is move cautiously in some of these bigger um, online support groups. Susie B's need to throw everything away in her house is not necessarily your situation. Um, so while I'm not saying stay in mold, live in mold, and you can recover, I'm not saying that by any means, but um, I have seen many cases where people don't have to throw away every piece and personal thing in their life, which is a trauma in and of itself. Yeah. Um, so always get a second opinion too for the home and how you can clean your items. And it's okay to ask for handholding in that process with your IEPs or whoever's doing your remediation. Um, but you know, just because mold is there does not mean it's horrible and everything's going to end for you. you know, just really work to find your center. And we are in a really great point in time right now under unfortunate circumstances that you have the ability to access teletherapy. I think 
everyone who's going through this should really be working with some type of counselor because the trauma of the illness and then the trauma of the relation to the home and then to your social connections um, can really keep you stuck and keep you feeling really sick and prevent you from recovery. So that's kind of my, my spiel. I so echo that. Um, I really believe hundred percent of people who've had mold toxicity have to deal with the trauma. Now, some people can do the work on their own, but I mm-hmm. do often recommend professionals and there's so many resources. We, we will have to do another talk on limbic system and how to, um, because that's a real key, even in my own journey, when I started to deal with the, because what happens is mold, it's a, it's a, a physiological trigger. It's not like a emotional trigger per se, but it triggers the same trauma response as another, like, you know, abusive situation or some sort of trauma. So your body, until you kind of unlink that, um, you're going to be stuck in this limbic loop where your limbic system is like, ah, everything's dangerous. Everything's bad. So that's part of healing. Um, and it can be done many, many different ways. Um, yes. Where can people find you? I know um, you've got a, a ebook. We'll be sure and share a link and information, but where can people find your information? Sure. So I'm a life after mold. And at the name of the website, that's the Facebook handle, that's the Instagram handle, that's the YouTube handle, there's a Pinterest that's in the works still. So um, you can find me there and I go in and out of ways of engaging my social media and kind of stepping back from it. So um, I do have some videos kind of lined up in the queue, hopefully to release soon. So. Hopefully I'll get and I would just encourage you all listening, go fo- follow us on Instagram. That's where I put a ton of the new, I'm really putting a lot of focus on that. So life after mold and uh, mine is just Dr. Jill Carnahan. Come find us, uh, hit, hit follow there. Cause you'll see all kinds of fun stuff. In fact, we just both posted today on this talk. So I just put it on my story today. So um, thank you. Thank you for this great jam packed information. Always a joy to talk to you. I'll be sure and link up here and uh, we'll see you guys all next time. Thanks again. Thank you so much.